So you see these paint marks, they indicate everything that I want dug out of this site by Brian and his team today. You probably remember that we very carefully situated and located the actual corners of the house on the site to optimize the tight fit of this home on this little lot. We located that day the corners of the house, but I need to dig well outside of the corners of the actual outline of the house today. We need eight inches outside of the footprint of the house to accommodate the footing. And then we need two or three feet outside of that so that the masons can get the work done. It takes space to have their stands and uh, of uh, their mud boards, to have stacks of block close to hand so that they can grab them and just efficiently put them in the wall. Ordinarily, you dig five feet outside of the building line on a project like this, but I don't have five feet all the way around this, so we're making the best of what we have. It's expensive to export dirt from a site like this. So what we don't want to do is to export any more dirt than we have to. This means we are trying to be just as accurate as we can with the depth of the dig and to pay as much attention to the depth of the dig as we did to the location. The first step in determining the depth or how deep you're digging is to first decide where you want your finished floor elevation to be. Now the engineer designed this foundation, but he did not specify how far out of the ground the finished floor should be. He didn't tell us how far above sea level the floor is. He told us how tall the foundation walls need to be. So I made the determination of where the finished floor elevation should be and subtracted the height of the walls and the footing and the gravel from that elevation. The top of these ledgers that you see bolted to this wall is the finished floor elevation and the depth of the dig is calculated from that. It's a delicate process determining how far out of the ground the house is going to sit. If the house is too low, you're going to have problems with moisture getting in. You won't be able to raise the grade of your yard. Sometimes you can't put enough gravel on your driveway because then the driveway gets higher than the garage floor. There's just a wide range of things that happen if your house is too low. If your house is too high, we'll have to bring in too much material on the backfill. But if you have to pick too high or too low, always pick too high. Generally, higher is better. Now I have attached these two by four ledgers on the back retaining wall at the location of the finished floor. Since I know this, I can simply look at the plan and read the total height of the various foundation systems and dig so that there is enough space to fit the foundation, the walls, the footing, the gravel, everything, locating the finished floor at the height of the top of these ledgers. The foundation is made up of several different parts. You'll see all of these in detail, but for now just know that we are digging down so the foundation will fit. This is a net export job, which means we will end up exporting about 17 loads or 170 cubic yards of dirt permanently from the site. There are some sites where dirt needs to be brought in to optimize the house site, which is also expensive because you have to buy the dirt and haul it in. We are in the enviable position of having to do both, both on this house. We're going to export some of the fill that's here and bring in some structural material to use in the right places as we move the foundation forward. The perfect situation is to balance the grade where the material that you dig out or cut is dumped or filled on site in areas that need to, to uh, increase 
in elevation. We don't have room to do that. That's not the way it's working out. But that's all right, because it's not a long haul to get rid of the dirt. And besides that, it just has to happen. We are primarily exporting and digging this today because it's a crawl space foundation, which you can think of like a teeny tiny shallow basement without room to actually stand up. The floor system of the house itself will be made of wood, but it will be attached to short block walls, which are set a few feet into the ground. Generally speaking, it is the job of the excavation contractor to operate the equipment safely, to follow paint lines, to read offsets, to use a laser, and to follow the plans. Your excavation contractor is not an engineer. Even though they have experience with these things, the foundation of your house as it is important, and it's worth paying an engineer for the specific details of the design that will make the difference between success and failure over time. This fellow is the engineer on this foundation, Dave Thomas, not the guy that owns Wendy's hamburger joints. He's here to have a look at what we're doing, to get a test on the soils and compaction, and make sure things are in order and are complying with the assumptions he made about the site when he made his calculations. When our foundation is done and in place, I'll describe exactly and show exactly how the system works and a few of the very interesting points that Dave brought to my attention. It's just going to be easier to understand once the concrete and block are all built and in place. The costs of digging and exporting all this material will be made available to our supporters and you can find details on accessing this information in the notes to this video. Although this dig took about three days, pretty much throughout the whole time I was continually watching and measuring and checking and verifying and replacing paint marks on the ground to assist the operators. This keeps the machines at maximum productivity which helps keep costs down, especially on a time and materials job like this. Now, if you're wondering what's going on with his water, don't worry. We're going to be talking about that and working on taking care of this very soon. It's not something you can ignore on a project like this. I've attached these 2x4 ledgers on the back retaining wall at the location where I want the finished floor to be. Since I know this, I can simply look at the plan, read the total height of the various foundation components, and dig so that there is enough space to fit the foundation into the hole so that the finished floor reaches a prop proper level. The foundation is made up of several different components, and you'll see all of those in detail, but for now, just know that we are digging down so the foundation will fit. One of the benefits of a crawl space foundation on a site like this is that all the dirt we are exporting is one, soft, so the dig is easy, and two, the dirt's pretty heavy. So removing it from the site reduces the weight on the site, therefore the weight on the retaining wall system, therefore the tendency for the lot to settle. This greatly increases the confidence I have in the overall quality of this house pad in terms of stability. It was a great piece of input from my engineer. Just an example of how thoroughly Dave Thomas understands the complexities and the nuances of structural engineering. The depth of this dig is being carefully monitored and checked using a laser. A laser in construction consists of a sending unit that is stationary and projects a laser beam, an invisible laser beam, in a level plane all across the job site. The ground man holds a sensor which is clamped to a rod. This sensor beeps when the sensor is in line with this invisible laser and allows the ground man to communicate with the operator whether or not the depth needs to go down or come up or stay the same and move along. I first encountered lasers in 1989 when I was working for MS Concrete. Dennis Bunker brought one out. I think it was made by Spectrophysics. I don't even know if they're still in business. But I remember it was expensive. When he told us how much it cost, it was stunning. But right away, it 
put a man out of work, the guy who the day before had been looking through the optical builder's level and calling out to the man holding the rod whether or not it needed to go up or down to get to grade, had been replaced. Once we reach our targeted depth and things are smoothed up and cleaned up, we start with the first portion of our foundation, which is gravel, three-quarter minus. It forms a very uniform, flat, compactable, even base. It enables the concrete to cure at a uniform rate. That is, the moisture goes out of the bottom of the footings all at the same rate. And it makes a nice, smooth, or at least regular and friendly surface to crawl on. When we're building and putting the plumbing in under the crawl space, when it's being insulated and the wiring's happening in the crawl space, as well as when the owner ends up living here and has to get under his house to do maintenance or additions or upgrades, at least he will know that he's crawling on a uniform and smooth gravel base. Now just putting the gravel down is not enough. It is critically important that it be compacted. And we're using a lot of time and a lot of effort compacting the subgrade here today. Using a machine to compact is known as mechanical compaction. It's the only way to go. You can't rely on water or gravity or even just a truck rolling back and forth or tractor tires to compact the soil well enough under your foundation to make sure that you're not going to have any problems with settlement. We're using three different machines for compaction. A vibratory roller covers lots of ground, packs it really tight, but is a little hard to maneuver. A vibroplate will pack into corners and down the edges and it will compact, you know, maybe up to four inches of structural fill to a pretty good density, but it doesn't hit it really hard if you're over about four inches deep. A jumping jack Will, comp will compact a six to eight inch lift, in my opinion, and you can also get it into very tight corners and inside of footings and places that you can't get the other machines. But it will beat you to death and it doesn't leave as smooth a finish, so we're using all three of these machines at various times and in various places to make this pad really hard. I've known Brian for 17 years. I've watched him sort of grow up in construction around here. I was also very relieved when my excavator, Denny Potter, who I'd used for a long time, sold his business, and then I found out, well, he sold it to Brian. That's a good thing, because Brian had been doing commercial concrete work for around, around here for years for Bruce Caldwell and had been operating his equipment and setting his forms and coordinating his jobs, and I knew right away that Brian Reynolds, as the owner of an excavation company in Roseburg, Oregon, would just be a real asset and a continuation of an excellent tradition that Denny had started that I could rely on while I was contracting, and I was not disappointed in that. It's a testament to the quality of both men when I point out that Dexter, the man who can stack rock like he's using his bare hands with this excavator, who has such a nice touch on the excavator, worked for Denny Potter for I think 16 or 17 years and has just come right over with the equipment and is working for Brian and doing a fine job for him also. 
That's one of the things you can look for in a subcontractor is longevity in his employment relationships with his employees. Because if that's in place, you know two things. It's a good hand and a good boss. And you're not going to be near as happy with your subcontractor doing your work if he hasn't learned how to get, first, if he hasn't learned how to identify a good hand, and second, if he hasn't learned how to keep him. So long-term relationships between the employed and the employer is one pretty clear indication of somebody that you're going to be able to use as a subcontractor. Brian and his guys are tops. Now you can see how important staging is by watching this equipment work. This is a small lot. There isn't a lot of room to maneuver and certainly no extra room for storing materials. I am very fortunate to have vacant lots on both sides and kind neighbors who are letting me store some extra dirt, park some equipment, and mobilize or move around on their ground so that I can get the work done on my ground. If I didn't have that option, this project would just get a lot more expensive and a lot slower and a lot more frustrating. It's something to keep in mind when deciding on a lot and trying to forecast what your costs are going to be. It is slower and more expensive to work in tight spaces. In the next video in our series, we will deal with drainage issues. You may have noticed some wet areas that we were working with in this dig. Generally speaking, the excavation contractor, and certainly the excavation equipment, is the same with the guy who's going to dig the footings, dig the foundation, and solve the drainage issues. So if possible, try to have him take care of it while he's here. In any case, as always, we hope you stick around to see how we resolved the drain issues on our lot. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.